All right, the title of my sermon this evening is Care for the Dying. And I want to preach a sermon just, uh, this is a soul winning sermon, okay, it's kind of help motivate you and inspire you. And obviously, when, when you hear sermons on soul, and there's so many different aspects that you can go into. I mean, it's such, it's such a, a deep topic. It's so important. It's so critical. You know, this is extremely important. It's a type of church. This is, this is one of the things that I hope would define our church is soul winning, right? Our care for the dying, for the lost, for the people who need to hear the gospel. I mean, we just got back from a soul winning time, right, where I, I think ju virtually everybody in this room was out you know, trying to preach the gospel. And if they weren't out today, they'll be out tomorrow, they'll be out whatever, you know, another day of the week. It's a, it's a really important thing. But the, the aspect that I want to focus on this evening is our motivations for doing it and the care. That's what I call it, care for the dying. Because, you know, while it is important to understand our duties as born-again believers, that God has entrusted us with the gospel, that we are ambassadors for Christ, that, that we should go out and reconcile the people to God in His stead, and that this is our job, this is our duty. And we started off in Luke 14, and we're going to kind of see that here, that this is our responsibility, this is our duty that we need to be doing, whether you want to or not. It's something that's entrusted to you, and you ought to be doing that as a believer. But I'm not going to focus as much on that aspect as to the motivation for doing it. You know, we're, we're, we're doing this challenge in the month of June to try to give the gospel to at least one person every single day in the month. And the goal is to not just do and focus on this for the month, but to change your behavior to become a regular soul winner so that you view people with the proper care as people that need to hear the gospel to change your life, not just for a month, but for a lifetime. To be able to look at people and think about soul winning because you're looking at people differently. You're, it, you know, it, this is more than just checking off a box. This is more than just, well, I just need to make sure I'm serving the Lord. So I'm, look, having the, the, the times and everything is extremely important to have the scheduled times and to make sure you are checking off boxes, to keep yourself in order and in line and say, I need to be doing this. I need to be keeping a minimum. I need to be reading my Bible. You know, I need to be doing these things. But we need to always also remind ourselves that it's not just about checking off boxes. Right? The whole point of soul winning is the people. It's not just how you know, spiritual can I be. While that is important, that's not, that shouldn't be at least the only motivation behind it. And when it comes to soul winning, there's many motivations you could have. Serving God, loving God, right? Being obedient unto the Lord. That's a great motivation. Uh, even this month, you know, I said there's going to be a prize for those that complete the challenge. That could be a motivation. So I do this. I want to motivate people. You know, maybe you don't always have the most spiritual <laughs> things in mind, when, you know, motivations in mind when you're, when you're doing things. But we want, to, we want to attain that. We want to grow to that. We want to get to the point to where, you know, those things don't matter. But when you have these competitions and prizes and things like that, they do help to get people just kind of fired up a little bit. And you got a goal and there's, a, there's an end in sight. I'm not against them. That's why we do them. But I want to try to get beyond that type of thinking and really dig into the motivation for what we're doing here. Let's start reading here in Luke 14, because Jesus makes this great um, a parable, if you will, about, about this supper. Now, the, me the, the, the primary meaning of this parable, first of all, is just to demonstrate that Israel is rejected, that they were the chosen people, they're rejecting Jesus. They give all these excuses not to serve the Lord, so God is rejecting them. But there's another meaning here that's more, that could just be applicable as, as a more general sense of our duty to go out and compel people to come in and get people saved, which is what I want to focus on. So uh, I just want to bring that up because I'm not going to be focusing on the Israel aspect of this, even though that was the primary reason it was brought up, because there's still more we could learn and glean from this teaching. So verse 15 says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So the statement is regarding, you know, being in heaven with God, right? Or in the kingdom of God, right? This is, this is an afterlife type of a situation that is being brought up here. Excuse me. And then Jesus responds to this 
with this story in verse 16. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. And there is going to be a great supper of the Lord. Okay? That is after our, you know, the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be a great supper. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb that's going to come in the future. And this is what I believe he's referring to about this great supper. And he's going to make these uh, correlations here. He says in verse 17, he sent his servants, excuse me, he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the, lane, the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. So, there's this great supper, this great feast. This Lord prepares, and he bids his friend, he bids his servant, he bids people to come. But then when it's time to come, they're all just making up excuses. Oh, yeah, sorry, I can't make it. Yeah, I know I wanted to be there, sorry, but I, I mean, there's this other thing going on. Obviously, that's going to make someone mad when you, you spend all this time and preparation, you're, you're getting everything just ready, set up, and then people just blow you off, right? So he's like, you know what? We're still having this party. We're still having this supper. So just, just start bringing in poor people, maimed, blind, whatever. Like, I want my house filled. I want to have a great feast here. So go and bring people in. And then the servant said in verse 22, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. He said, there's still room. We brought all these people in, and there's still room left over to be at your house, to be at the supper. And you know, this one point right here I think is great, is that there's always going to be room at the Lord's table. Or it's never just going to be completely full. There's always room for, for people to be able to join the Lord at this great supper in the, in the kingdom of God. Verse 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. So, obviously, that's referring to, you know, the nation of Israel, and he had bidden them, he came unto his own, his own received him not. But what's, what I see as important here is just talking about people being saved, right? To be able to participate and be at the supper in the afterlife, this great, at the kingdom of God, to participate in the supper. And he's saying, you know what? I want you to go out, bring the poor, bring the maim. I want you to go out and compel people to come in. And this is what we're doing when we go out and preach the gospel to people. We try to get people saved. Is we're trying to compel them. We're trying to persuade people. And when you go out soul winning, this is my first point, is that it needs to be you know, from the heart, this isn't just a script that you recite. Where it's not a sales pitch. It's not something that you just go in your head and you just, just make sure you're on the list. Look, when you're first getting started, I know it might be difficult. You might be nervous. You, get, you kind of have notes and you, you have a, a certain pattern and a format. And that's great to stick to that. But what you need to do is you want to get to the point to where you're, you're, you're dealing with people and caring about those people and trying your best to compel them to be saved. So you should be continuing to learn and to grow and to study and to memorize verses and to think, what can I be doing? I can reach more people. What can I, be, what can I understand? What can I use that's going to help people understand and to explain, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ and to get this point across? I was out today and I was dealing with people and I haven't had this happen in a while, but, you know, sometimes you run into people and for whatever reason, it's just not clicking. And you bring up examples. So I'm bringing up, you know, eternal life is a gift. And you're all these different ways you can explain. It's a gift. It's free. So you don't have to pay for it. All this other stuff. Not getting it. Bring up being born again. When you're born into a family, you're part of God's family. It's eternal. You know, you don't have to do anything. It's not any work. You're born into that family, you know, and, and just all of this stuff. And you just keep on real. And after a while, you know, sometimes people just aren't going to get it. And it is the way it is. But... The point is that you want to always be thinking, what else maybe could I say to help a person understand? Is there another way, is there another verse, is there another truth about the gospel in the scripture, some verse that's going to help them go, oh, I get that. That makes sense to me. And through my experience of soul winning, what I've found out, what personally seems to work for people in general, is when I'm dealing with people who are younger, 
teenage people, you know, whatever, somewhere in that younger age group where they're not yet like having a family or having children of their own, that using the illustration of a gift resonates very well with them. They understand gifts, they love gifts. You know, when you're younger, you, you, you love birthdays and these holidays. Why? Because you get gifts from people, right? I mean, it's cool. Like, it's something that kids get really excited about. So it's something that hits closer to home for them. So I really take the time to go through a gift example, a gift analogy, to help them understand, well, salvation, I mean, it's like a gift. This is free. I mean, someone's giving that to me because they love me. Right? I spend the time on it. They, they, that resonates with them. They understand that better. Again, in general, by and large, that works well with them, as opposed to people who I could tell have children, especially you knock on a door and there's like a woman and her child or whatever. They understand the concept of being in a family, being born again, the love that you have, that unconditional love you have for someone who is your child. And yes, you're going to discipline them, you're going to punish them at the same time. Hey, your child's your child. Even if they break all your rules, you're still going to love them. They're still in your family. This, you know, those are the types of concepts that reaches those people. So you have to continually be analyzing what else can I do because you care about the people. Because you care for the dying, because you want them to understand the gospel. And this is what the free gift is. And you want to compel them and persuade them. And maybe they have a different belief when you show up. And maybe they're thinking it's works, everything else. What you want to do and what you should be trying to do is persuading them. Well, hey, look at what the Bible says right here. This is what the scripture says. I don't think that's matching up. You know, you be tactful, whatever. You learn ways of talking with people that's going to be received well by them because you care for them. Because that may be, for all you know, that may be the only chance that they're going to get before they die to hear the gospel. That's right. That's right. It is that important, and we don't want to be, you know, on the one hand, we don't want to waste a bunch of time. But on the other hand, you don't want to be too flippant and just be see ya with people who are maybe not quite getting it, but they're ready to hear, right? They're willing to listen and willing to learn. Uh, but that's, again, that's a whole other topic I could probably preach on for an hour about that alone, of figuring out that discernment. But what we see here in this parable is that God is sending people out because he wants, you know, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants people there. We should want to have more people there. I mean, how, how great of a gift is eternal life and being able to, to sit down with the Lord? But, like, this is one of those, those areas, at least I would, I would hope you feel the same way, that you don't want to just be there alone, right? I mean, when you have great gatherings, what's one of the best parts about having, you know, Thanksgiving meals or Christmas meals? Being around, surrounded by family and people you love, and the more family members and people get together, the better it is. It's like, man, this is great. We have all these, look at how many people are here. This is amazing, right? And, and, and that's the, the way you should be viewing this great marriage supper of the Lamb. Like, how many more people can we bring to this party, to this dinner? It's going to be so much better if we could bring more people with us, Right? So we, we, need, we want to go compel people because God wants his house to be filled. We ought to want his house to be filled also. Now, this, you know, he continues on past this uh, parable, verse number 25. He says, and there, went out, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So... I wanted to continue on reading that just because there's obviously a cost involved and it's work to decide to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, to do the things that he did, to go out and compel people. It's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require time. It's going to require effort and work. Look, you can't get better at winning people to the Lord and persuading them if you're not investing the time doing it gaining experience, studying on your own, practicing, doing whatever it is that you can do to become better. It requires a lot of work to the point where Jesus is using real extreme examples here saying, look, it's got to be about him, right, about, about Jesus. He says, you can't be my disciple if you're going to have anyone before me. That's what he's saying there when he's saying, if you don't hate your father, your mother, wife, to look, Jesus needs to be primo, number one. Make him number one in your life. 
If you're not making him number one, you can't be his disciple. Doesn't mean you can't be saved. This means you can't be his disciple. I mean, if you're going to serve someone other than Jesus first, he doesn't need, he doesn't want you as a disciple. You have to be a follower of him. No, you got to, you got to be able to follow him no matter what. And so he says, he follows it up with, whosoever does not bear his cross. And you remember what we were preaching on, uh, all the sacrifice he made on Wednesday night. If you didn't catch the Wednesday night sermon, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Went through all the sacrifice that he made for us and the cross that he had to bear and, and everything that he went through. He's saying, you know what? If you're not going to bear your cross, whatever that most difficult part is, of, you know, and follow and, and, and not worry about the shame or whatever else, and come after he says, you can't be my disciple. So to be his disciple is to require work. And we need to be ready to do that. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, and again, I, I don't want to get too far into to that aspect either because the whole point of what I really want to drive home is, is our spirit, our attitude, our care for people when we, when we give people the gospel, right? And looking on people that way as caring for them. And one of the things to look out for in your own spirit, your own attitude, is one of pride or arrogancy when you go to preach the gospel. Because the more that you learn, and being in our church or being in similar churches where we really focus on Scripture, on the Bible, and we try to set high standards for ourselves, and you're reading and listening to preaching and doing all this stuff, and you're growing a lot and learning a lot, just by, by participating with all of that, you'll find yourself much more knowledgeable than the vast majority of people that you're going to talk to because, unfortunately, so many people just have never even read the Bible one time, don't study their Bible. They may go to church every week, but that's it, right? And, and we're saying that's not even a standard. Like, like we want the standard much higher for ourselves because we, we want to do more. We want to do what's right. We want God to be pleased with us. We want to be his servants. We want to put him first. So this isn't trying to be arrogant of saying, oh, yeah, well, we just know so much more. It's just a fact that when people study more, you're going to be more knowledgeable than other people, and a lot of people just don't study at all. We want to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We want God to be pleased with us, so we study but when you go out and try to get people saved, you don't try to wow them with your intelligence and your wisdom and your skill and your speech and your eloquence. It's not about that. Amen. Okay? And make sure that you're not letting this knowledge puff you up and you don't have the charity that edifies, because that word, that word charity is a root word of like caring, right? Caring for the dying. You're showing charity and love to other people, which is why we preach the gospel in the first place. It's not to win arguments. It's not to show people how smart you are. It's not to show people how spiritual you are. And, and oh, man, oh, well, the Bible says this and this and this. And I'm going to quote you every day. Like, look, don't act like that. You can have verses memorized, and you can quote them without making it be about you and how smart you are and how wise you are. And don't get goaded into that when you run across somebody who is already lifted up and wants to show you how smart they are. You know what you do with people like that? See ya. Don't let them just get you into some debate because they want to argue because they're already lifted up. Look, if someone's lifted up with pride, they're not going to be receptive to the gospel. I mean, you give them the opportunity, but if they're not going to listen, if they're not going to humble themselves, they're not ready to get saved. God's going to have to do something in their life to help humble that person. But at that moment, at that time, forget it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is where I return. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So when he came unto Corinthians, he said, you know what? When I first came to you, I wasn't using all this excellent speech and this wisdom and coming to you with all these hidden dark sayings and showing you how smart and how wise I am. He's like, you know what I was preaching? Christ and him crucified. 
And that's what we need to be focused on. Right? When we go out soul winning, we're going unto people, we're preaching the gospel. We don't need to get into these debates. And, you know, I, I, before I learned more, I would always be thinking in my mind, you know, when I was going way back in the day when I was still learning soul winning and doing things, thinking like, oh, man, I wish Pastor Anderson was here because he could just totally, you know, eat this guy's lunch, someone who was real proud and trying to show all of their wisdom and all this other stuff. And it, it took me a while to learn that you don't need that. You, hey, just worry about the gospel. You don't need to argue about some obscure fact, some history point from whatever, you know. You just have to preach Christ and Him crucified. That's, it really is that simple. We don't need to get involved in, in these other arguments and 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 going down rabbit trails that's going to distra distract from Christ and Him crucified. You don't need to know all of the facts of, you know, Char Charles Taze Russell and, and how, how much of a false prophet he is and all of his false predictions. And all you don't need to know all that stuff when you're preaching a Jehovah's Witness. You need to preach Christ and Him crucified. That's what's going to get him saved. Now, I'm not saying that you may not get through to that person if, you know, if, if, the, if the situation arises to be able to use something like that. But at the end of the day, salvation is the same for everybody. And what we really ought to be focusing on is Christ and crucified. And when you do have those conversations with people, it's still the same spirit. You're not going to them with this excellency of wisdom and, and puffing yourself up. It's being real. And, and just being down at that base level of simplicity in Christ. Let's keep reading here in verse number 3. It says, and, when I, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And again, I've had people ask me before, you know, because I have like a science background. I have a computer science degree. I've studied a lot of like creationism versus um, uh, evolutionary theory and all this other stuff. And there's knowledge that I have of those processes that, you know, people say, well, why don't you, you know, when you come and talk to people like that, why don't you bring that up? And why don't you talk about that? Because that's the wisdom of man. That's man's wisdom anyways. Even just knowing all the carbon dating and the flaws and the reason why it's not as reliable as you think it is and everything else. Look, I'm not going to the people with enticing words of man's wisdom because I don't want them trusting in man's wisdom. Like the Apostle Paul says, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. So even if you have the wisdom of man, you're not going out to win them using the wisdom of man. You go to them with the gospel. So if someone is atheist, there's a real science person, you know what I'm going to go to them with? The gospel. The gospel of God first, because that's where the power is. That is what's going to get through to them. That is the power of God. And if you care about people more than you care about yourself, who cares? You can win debates. You can show how much more knowledge you have than someone else. But what good is that going to do? What profit is that going to do? You could, it, it could profit your ego. Oh, well, I told that. They thought they were real smart. <laughs> they don't. Don't ever let that wisdom go to your head. The whole point of gaining wisdom is really just to be able to, to minister and to serve other people. And you know what? All that wisdom that you can gain, it's not all about necessarily soul winning either. It could also be through training and teaching and discipling people as well. There's a lot of wisdom you can gain that you're not necessarily going to use out at the door soul winning. But you will use with the same people maybe later on. Now, okay, now we're going to train you. Now we're going to show you some other things in Scripture. Now we'll get into some of this other stuff and help strengthen your faith and, 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 and make you a stronger Christian. But when we go out to the door, we're focused on preaching Christ and Him crucified. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible 
Um, I, I'd be interested just for my, I, I'm just thinking about this now, how many times I probably turned to this passage since I've been pastoring here, just because I like this so much and I love the spirit that the Apostle Paul has with the Thessalonians here when he's, when he's you know, talking about the work that he did ministering to the church of Thessalonica. We're going to start reading in verse number 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the vision and this is the spirit that I see for our church. Verse number one, the Bible reads, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So first of all, he's just saying, you know what? You know that we were treated shamefully. You know that when we were at Philippi, you know, we had, we had all these contentions and fightings, but we were still bold to preach the gospel. We didn't let that stop us and deter us. We kept going. Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. We're not faking it. We're not trying to trick you. We're not just, you know, these unclean people. We're, you know, it's not in guile. Verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Hey, God allowed us to have this great job to be able to preach the gospel. So we're going to do it. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Our hearts. Our heart needs to be in the right place. You want to go out and preach the gospel? It's not so you can raise your hand in church, or, oh, I got this many people saved. Look, I like counting people saved. We do it all the time. But that's not the purpose of it, is just to show off everybody how many people you got saved. It's motivating for everybody when we see a number on the board. We're like, man, we're, like, we're down. If, you, if you've been looking at the board out there, our goal for the year versus where we are right now, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Okay, we've had a bump in the road, but the, the point of that is to motivate and say, well, how are we going to do this? What can we do? I'm using it because guess what? We're doing a lot more soul winning marathons now on Saturdays. That's one of the ways that I want to reach that goal. I think that's great. If it's going to fire us up and drive us to do more work, then great. But I'll tell you what, God knows our hearts. It's not about this glory of you personally getting these numbers. It's trying to reach people. It's not trying to please men. We're trying to please God with what we're doing here. Verse 5, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. See, God knows the heart. That's why he's witness to not, you know, not being covetous over people. And he's like, you know, we didn't use flattering words. We didn't come to you promising you all this stuff and telling you how great you are and stuff. We go out preaching the gospel telling you you're a sinner. <laughs> right? That's, those aren't flattering words. And then offering the free gift that God offers, that Jesus has offered up through, uh, through faith in his name. But we're not going out just trying to... See, the people who flatter, they're trying to set a trap. The people who flatter are going to tell you how great you are to get, just suck you in and bring you in and get you to spend your money and give all your money here we're not trying to do that. We're going not with flattering words, with truthful words. Here's the reality of the situation. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. Jesus Christ came and paid the price. What are you waiting for? Right? It's simple. It should be a very easy decision to make. Put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're not going just trying to butter people up either. Verse number 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Verse 8, So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel, excuse me, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. I love this attitude. They were willing, when they went out, when they went to, to Thessalonica, they were there to preach the gospel. They were to win, there to win people to Christ, start a church, get people fired up. He says, you know what? We were willing not to impart the gospel only because they cared so much for these people. I mean, it takes care to go out and preach the gospel to people, does it not? You care about people when you want them to be saved and go to heaven. Yes, it does. But you say, you know what? That wasn't, you know, that's not all we were going for. We were going there. We really care about you, not just your eternal salvation, but even more than that. That we're willing to empower our own souls to just help you, to help you to grow more than just, just getting you saved and moving on. 
We really care about you, okay? And this is the spirit and the attitude that we need to have. I don't want to be too methodical and quick and, and robotic, is not methodical, robotic, in the, okay, knock on the door, go through my script, pray, move on. No. Care about the people, try to communicate with them, persuade them, show them, teach them, get them saved, hopefully, but then pray for that person. See if you can communicate further with them. Try to get them plugged into church, whatever you can, um, to continue and you know, impart not the gospel of God only, but also your own souls. Care about the people. Obviously, we all have our own limitations to one degree or another of the amount of time you have and, and maybe physical proximity, distance between you, but we also have a lot of cool tools, you know, digitally with like telephones and things like that where you can still communicate with people and try to help get people plugged in. And, you know, do what you can is kind of the point. Now, people like the Apostle Paul, they were missionaries, they were going out, and they had full time and able to do more investing in people, but you do what you can do. You see, God knows the heart, and when you care about people, you'll try to make things work. Verse number nine, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. And again, here's a reference to the work, the labor, the hard work that is involved in doing this type of thing. I mean, if you really care about people, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require work investment. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. And, you know, we see here how Paul is expressing their desire to not just preach the gospel, but, as you see in verse 12, to teach them to walk worthy of God. That's the next step after salvation. So they're imparting their time to people who, yes, you want to get them saved. Yes, you want to preach them the gospel. But you also want them to walk worthy of God. Teaching them commandments. Teaching them how to live, how to walk, how, what they ought to be doing. Discipling people. That is part of the Great Commission. And what we'd like to do is to get people, I mean, just bring them in here. We go through the Bible as a group and and get taught good doctrine on how to live and how we ought to do things. So getting people plugged in is important. This is the mindset and the attitude that the Apostle Paul had. Now, this level of care and concern, I've been, you know, using this in the context and probably what all of us have had in our minds is when we go out and knock door to door on our scheduled times, right? It's probably what you've been thinking about, but... This needs to be in your heart more than just at the door-to-door -door soul winning times, caring about people. I'm hoping this challenge is going to help us to get to that point where you're thinking about people more frequently. But I got to tell you, you know, there's, there's one area where our church has been lacking in tremendously. And it wasn't always this way, but I noticed this with our visitor challenge. We are missing so many opportunities of caring for people and their salvation, when we have visitors coming in the door to our church, I ought not to be the only one that's trying to give the gospel to visitors that come to church. Okay, that is a shame for everyone that calls himself a soul winner in our church. If I'm the only one, by the time I get everything else done and there's still nobody talking to our visitors, okay, I saved this sermon for tonight because I didn't want to preach this way when we had visitors in church. But I'll tell you what, if, if, I, if I came to the church, if I wasn't a pastor and I, was a, and I was a congregant, and people say, oh, Brother Dave brought a visitor to church, okay, first of all, I don't want people thinking, well, of course Brother Dave gave him the gospel. Of course he did, because he's always giving people the gospel, so, and just assume that their person's saved. Maybe I did try to give him the gospel, and they wouldn't listen to me because they're my friend or my relative, and I'm just not getting through to them. What a, what, a, what a shame it would be for me to bring someone I care about, someone I love, some visitor, and nobody breaches the subject of 
hey, if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you'd be going to heaven? And I'm hoping somebody is going to approach that person and give them gospel, and nobody does. We all fired up to go out door to door. How about when people walk in our doors? I mean, you can't ask for a better time than someone coming in our doors. Okay, people, we need to have, make it a point when you have a visitor. I don't care. You have friends here. You have people that you love, you want to catch up with. You need to make it a point to get a beeline to those visitors and, and make sure, one, they feel welcome, and two, we're going to preach the gospel to everybody that comes in through this door, and don't assume that anybody is saved. I don't care if they walk in, suit, tie, family, everyone's well-dressed, King James Bible's in hands, come in, sit down, amen, hallelujah. Ask them if they know for sure if they die today, they're going to heaven. And make that a priority. Make the visitors a priority. This is important. Putting the care for people first. People who are visitors, being hospital. Hey, make that a priority. Please. I haven't been pleased with what I've been seeing. There have been people that have walked out of this church because I didn't have enough time to get to this person and that person. And they left. And those visitors haven't come back again. Missed opportunity. Please make this extremely high on your list and, and, and don't miss out on it. And you know what? This is not, uh, no one here should, first of all, get offended if you approach a family member or a visitor with the gospel. So don't think, oh, I don't know, I don't want to be uncomfortable. This is their mom or dad or brother. Look, that person who brought them is probably thinking, please, somebody give them the gospel. Right? right. <laughs> right? Don't, don't let that awkwardness of, of a familiar person put you off. I mean, why, why in the world would you be more willing to give a stranger the gospel than someone's friend or loved one? Right? Now, and I'm not sure if this goes through anyone's head, but I mean, this is just some of the things that I know people may think of to, to discourage you from approaching someone don't get sucked into this mindset, well, if they keep coming back, then maybe, you know, they'll hear things, and then they'll slowly get, no, 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 look, Just, when it comes to the gospel, with, with other things, sure, whatever, but when it comes to the gospel, seize the opportunity, every opportunity that you have. When we have visitors here, seize that opportunity. I, I look for the day where I can't make it to a visitor because there's already people who have stood up as soon as service is dismissed, Hey, how's it going? Nice to have you. And is already talking about the gospel. You cannot rely on me to do all the soul winning. I know you don't. I mean, you're, everybody has gone out soul winning. But please, this is extremely, extremely important. And we need to have this in our heart so when people come into the church, when we go out, when we're out in the world, when we're just out day to day, have this in your heart, caring for the dying. <laughs> Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Almost done. Actually, no, turn to Ezekiel 33. I was, I'm just going to read. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, because we need, with, with all the care that you want to put forth into people. Like the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonica. You know, he was willing not to preach the gospel of God only, but also to impart their own souls. Right? I mean, that's a, a high level of care for people. When you put yourself out there and care for people tremendously, and you want to do things, you want to help them, you want to give people rides to church, and you invest in people. Let's face it, I've invested in people, I'm sure you've invested in people before, and then what happens sometimes, they just end up, going away, or they stiff you, or, you know, they don't treat you right. It's like, look, man, I've been helping you, I've been helping this guy out, and it's just like, it's like it was nothing to him, or whatever. Get used to it, because that happens, okay? But that shouldn't make you hardened towards helping people. You need to just roll with it and continue to help people. I mean, think about Jesus. How many people has he died for, and how many people have even acknowledged the fact that he died for them. 
thank God he didn't take it personally to the point of like, well, I don't want to do anything for anyone now because these guys burned me. I mean, you run into people who have had a bad experience at church, now they don't want to go to any churches or whatever. Don't be that person that, well, this person burned me, so I'm not going to help anyone out anymore. I let this person get close to me, and they turned out to be a Benedict Arnold. They turned out to be some reprobate. Look, we just need to have the attitude of, I'm going to be loving and caring and trying to help and be a minister. And you know what? Sometimes it's going to hurt. Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He's viewing this, this relationship with this church of Corinth. Hey, he went out and got these people saved, so they're kind of like his children. He's saying, look, I don't need you to lay up for me. I'm going to lay up for you because that's the way it works in a family, right? The, the parents are looking out for their children, trying to provide their well-being, and I'm going to lay up so that you can have more and you can succeed, right? I mean, anyone who's in a, in a you know, normal, loving family, you're not just laying up a bunch of treasure for yourself. Anything that you lay up, anything you save up, you're thinking, hey, I want, I want to give my children the best advantage that they can have and help them become even better than I can ever be. That's what a, a good father is going to do for their children, and he says this in verse 15, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I'll do what it takes. Hey, I'll spend. I'll suffer a little bit. I'll sacrifice. I'll be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. But he's going to continue doing it anyways. Unfortunately, some people, you can help them and help them more and help them more. And it seems like the more you help them, the less they even care about it. But he doesn't say, so then I'm just going to quit it. He's going to keep on trying to minister and loving people and having the right spirit and attitude. When you get into this point of having a love for people, it goes with the territory. You're going to get burned. You're going to get burned. Keep going. Don't quit. Ezekiel 33 So last place I want to look at we need to have the right spirit we need to have the right attitude caring about people loving people loving the lost I'm going to close just kind of with this also being our responsibility and our duty okay I kind of started with that and we're going to finish with that Ezekiel 33 talks about the watchman right and it's our jobs to be watching, warning, and looking out for other people and caring for other people. Because that's what the watchman does. The watchman in a city, they're supposed to be on lookout. So if, so if there's people coming, they're going to attack the city. They're the first line of defense. They're looking out so that they can help protect everyone else inside the city. Right? So they're on the lookout. They're vigilant. They're putting forth the work. They're staying up late. They're, they're checking things out, and that's their job, to do that. And we're going to see here, let's just, let's just read the passage before I just explain all of it. Verse number 1, Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchmen, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Basically saying, look, this guy's doing his job. He's warning people. You hear the warning, and you're just like, yeah, whatever. Well, you can't, you can't blame the watchman. <laughs> he did everything he was supposed to do, right? He, he sent out the warning. That's up to you if you're going to dismiss the warning. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 5, it says, he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver a soul. But hey, the person that hears it and believes it is going, hey, well, <laughs> I'm going to take up my own steps, and they're going to you know, basically save their soul. They're going to deliver their own soul and not going to be hurt by the, uh, the oncoming danger. Verse 6, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, 
If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So they're saying, if this is this guy's job to watch. And he sees the danger coming, he sees the army coming in, they got other swords ready to go, they're ready to fight. And he just sits back, or he just says, well, I'm going to save myself, I'm out of here. He says, well, you know, people are going to be killed, people are going to suffer from that, but it's his, it's going to fall on his head, on his shoulders for not doing his job and not warning the people. That's his responsibility, and God's going to hold him responsible for that. Verse 7, so thou, so now he's going to apply this, right? He gives this example, a physical example, a watchman defending a city, protecting a city. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Now specifically, he's talking to Ezekiel, and he's saying, look, I'm giving you words, and I'm giving you warnings, and I'm giving you messages, and you need to relay this to the people, right? Because they need to be warned. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. I mean, it's going to happen. Whether or not he knows it, it doesn't matter, because he's wicked, he's sinning, he's iniquity, he's going to die. He says, But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So when it's your job and your responsibility to be a watchman and, and to warn people about destruction and to warn, hey, God said this, thus saith the Lord, you know, you better not do that, then if you don't do your job, God's going to hold you responsible. And there's multiple ways of applying this, right? One is going to be me as a pastor, you know, if I know the word of the Lord and I know what the problem is with sin and I know what the, the judgment of God's going to be, even for people who are saved, if they're going to sin and they're going to continue in their iniquity and wickedness, if I'm not warning them, hey, God's going to judge you, hey, God's not going to hold you, you know, uh, blameless in this regard and you're going to get judged, if I'm not doing that, then God's going to hold me responsible for people being ignorant of his word and not knowing, you know, the severity or whatever. But also you can apply this not just to saved people, but unsaved people. Right? It's our job to go and preach the Word of God. We know what God said where unbelievers are going to go. We know what, what happens to people who die in their sins. He has given us the, the ministry of reconciliation. He's made us the ambassador. He's given us that job and entrusted us with that responsibility to preach the gospel. We need to be going out and warning people. We need to be telling them about the destruction. We need to be warning them about hell. We need to be warning them about what's going to happen if they don't put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our job. That is our duty. And as the Bible is saying here, the way that God's holding some responsibility, saying, you know what, that person that dies in their sin, they're going to go to hell. I mean, that's, going to, that's, that's just what's going to happen. It's already been proclaimed. God, that judgment's there. But you need to be going out and warning them. So when we go out soul winning, you warn someone, hey, this is what the Bible says, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You think you get to heaven some other way. You think there's another way. It ain't going to happen, right? Now, they, they could reject you and say, no, no, I think it's all, all religions are all the same. You're all worshiping the same God, whatever. Look, you warned them. That's, <laughs> that's not what the Bible says. That's not what God says. People go to hell right. if they're not going through Jesus Christ. It's a warning. That's up to them. You know, take what they will with that warning. But you can say, my hands are clean. And just to show you that this concept does apply uh, you know, in the New Testament, it's not just for Ezekiel, it's not just for that. The Apostle Paul references this in Acts chapter 20, verse 25. The Bible reads, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why is he pure of the blood of all men? He says this in verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I haven't held anything back. I've given you all the warnings. I've given you all the teachings. My hands are clean. This is where we need to be. Hey, my hands are clean. I've done my best. I've tried my hardest. I've preached. I haven't held anything back. I'm not withholding truth. I'm not, you know, whether it's good or bad, whatever, you know, unpleasant truths, I'm not holding back. Because I love you. I care about you. But my hands are free from your blood. It's on you what to do now.
I thank God for this church, and I thank God for every single person in here, and the ones that aren't in here right now. Not everyone can make it all the time, but we have an awesome church, and soul winning is at the forefront. Let's keep it that way. Let's introspect in our own lives, in our own hearts, get a care, especially this month. I, I, man, I would love to see people participating in this, and, and not just participating, but succeeding. Make it important. You, you have to, if you don't make it important, you will not do this challenge. It, it, I mean, first of all, it has to be on your mind because tomorrow is Monday. And for many people, you will be starting a work week. You're going to go to your job. You're going to do your normal routine. You need to be thinking, I need to try to give someone the gospel today. And that, the day one is always the hardest day because if that's what, not what you normally do, then... It, it's harder to remember those things. We want, you know, think about it, get it in your head, go, no, I want to do this. I mean, for the next 30 days, I'm going to try to get someone saved. And, you know, last year, June was our biggest month for the year of salvations. It's great. We could use a boost like that when we're trying to reach a goal. I mean, hey, it makes sense. The more people that you try to talk to, the more days you spend trying to give the gospel to someone, the more people are going to get saved. Just, it's a total just time investment thing. And, um, you know, be in prayer, too. Pray that, you know, God knows you're, you're, not, you're not necessarily going to be spending tons of time out. You're just going to have an opportunity maybe to try to talk to one person because you want to complete this challenge. Ask God, say, hey, God, make the most use of my time. I'm going to be here. I'm going to go there. Help me to cross paths with somebody that's going to actually listen and, and want to hear the gospel. And have that spirit and that heart, again, not, oh, man, I got to go preach the gospel to somebody. Look, hopefully you get to preach the gospel to somebody. Amen. And that they'll listen. And, and be in prayer this whole month for that, that, that God will man, you know, use this. And in fact, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would please use uh, the next 30 days here with our church Help everybody to, uh, to, you know, to be reminded in their spirit and their heart to, uh, to look on, on the lost, look on people out in the world in a, in a new light of wanting to, them to get saved and, and to want to reach the people, dear Lord, and that you would help us to be able to, to be thinking about this more regularly in our lives, that we're going to be thinking about the people that we come into contact with uh, being able to give them the gospel and talk to them about salvation. And I pray that you would please help us to, to work this into our day and that the people that you know we're going to come into contact with, that you'd help us and lead us so that we can be even more fruitful this month uh, in, in sometimes the, the little time that we have uh, apart from our, our normal schedule to, to be able to um, preach the gospel to people who are going to listen and not just blow us off, dear Lord. And uh, we're here to serve you, and we want to we wanna be more conformed under the image of your Son. We want to serve you and, um, and, just, and be better preachers of the gospel and ambassadors. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.